that's in John where it says that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. Um, and every miracle... Uh, right, Acts 10.38. Acts 10.38. Um, so whenever Jesus operated, he always operated um, as a man in right relationship with God, and that's how he healed people. But, you know, and, and uh, you know, where he talks about the paralytic, and it says that he said to, uh, that he forgave him. He says, son, your sins are remitted. He didn't do that as a man. He did that as a son of God. Well, right? he, he called himself the son of man. He said to show you the son of man has the power to forgive sin. And what he's doing is he's showing us because when he commissioned us in John 20, he said, as the father sent me, I send you. He breathed on him, said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they shall be forgiven. So he's passing on his heart. Yeah. You get it? So if you walk in unforgiveness, how are you going to give his love and how are you going to minister like Jesus did when Jesus walked in mercy and walked in love? He says, if you retain the sins of any, they'll be retained. Why? Because you're not going to walk in love. You're going to hold men accountable and you're going to get self-righteous and you're going to get legalistic. When Jesus forgave sin, he had the authority to forgive sin because he came and represented the Father. But yeah, he actually did that as a man. He, t he passed that torch in John 20. He did it as a man empowered by God. He had total authority to do that. He said, it's the Father speaking to me. The things I do, I don't do them on authority. I've been sent by God. So God sends him as the lamb. He's the total expression of the mercy of God and the forgiveness of sin. So of course he's in a perfect position to say, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Did he do that? Did he do it? Absolutely. The Bible says it in John 20. It actually says it in 1 John 5 too. You forgive their sins so that you can minister grace and love. That's why an unbeliever can be healed. Even if they didn't repent yet, because you see them beyond their sin. You see them for mercy. He didn't just die for your sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Does that entitle them to everlasting life? Well, they have to repent and come to the knowledge of truth and give their life to Jesus and all that. But you can minister to a person through the mercy of God and the forgiveness of sins. If you don't see them for face value and you see them for their value in Christ, you can minister love to people. That's what God did to this young man. He, he actually, he overlooked sin. He, he went past the sins of man and, and ministered mercy to the man. We can do that, and we're going to talk about that today. We can do that in every instance when we meet people out there on the streets. We're busy trying to get everybody saved, and Jesus told us to preach the kingdoms here and heal the sick. Why? To reveal the mercy of God. To reveal that love is greater than where they haven't been or have been. The goodness of God leads men to repentance. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, arise and walk. But to show you that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin, rise and walk. So what he's doing is he's seeing past the law of sin and death. And the law of the spirit of life that flows through Christ is already functioning. He hasn't even died on the cross yet. So what Martha's asking is, so the authority to do that certainly came from God. He's representing God when he's doing that, but he's still a man. He told us to follow him and the things he did, we shall do. The first thing after he said, as the Father sent me, I send you, and breathe the Spirit of God in him, the first thing he said to them is if you forgive, forgive. He's not using the word remit. If you forgive the sins of any, because there's, there's a little play with the word remit if, in your soul if you're not careful. He, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. In other words, I see past your sins. The word remit is only God can remit them, and that's where you could stumble. Forgive. If you forgive the sin, it just hit me the, what, you, what you asked. You said about remitting. It, he never, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Take heart, your sins are forgiven. So what he's saying is, I'm here representing the heart of God towards you, and I don't see you for sin. I see you for the way God sees you and man's created value. I'm going past your sins. I'm passing over your sins, and I'm going right to the core of God's love for you. Bam, and he takes his bed and walks. It's powerful. The first thing he tells his disciples is, if you forgive the sins of any, they shall be forgiven. forgiven. Isn't that amazing? That's what he told them after he raised from the dead and put his blood on the mercy seat, came back and breathed life back into his people. When he breathed on them, it takes you to the garden where God breathed into man and made him a living being. Jesus is the redemption of man. 
Jesus is the second breath of God to man. He, he brought life back. He redeemed us back to what we were called to be. <sighs> Must be important to God to have his life inside of us, to cost his son his life to get that back in us. Come on, that's something to be treasured, guys. Do you see how important this is to the Father? It's such a big deal. He paid the most extreme price. We can't even really wrap our mind around it. And then raised from the dead, separated from God, judged as sin, to crush its power forever, knowing that he would, he said, I commit my spirit to you. The whole time he was doing it by faith in a man's body, trusting God. That's why God was pleased with him, well pleased. Why? It's impossible to please God without faith. So it tells you that when he chose to come into the womb of Mary, he left the father by faith, trusting that when he was born, he would understand and things would be revealed and all that stuff. It, it says that he grew in stature. He grew in wisdom. He didn't just, as a newborn baby, know everything. It, it came to him. He grew in that. And he came by faith. When he died, he faced death by faith. He's ready to die. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What he's saying is, okay, I'm about ready to face what I'm not. I'm life. I'm not death. I'm, I'm, I'm the author and giver of life. I've never been in the realm of death, but I'm going to taste it for everyone so they never have to taste this. And he was separate and cut off. So we will always forever be joined. Do you hear the intimacy of God's love for us? To go to that extreme and be that legal and binding in his accomplishment to win us. So now he does that. He breathes the spirit of God back into them and seals them for that day. It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the regeneration of their spirit. They're born again. Because in John, he breathed on them and said, be filled with Holy Spirit. And in Luke 24, he said to tarry in the city and you'll receive power when the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, comes upon you to be a witness. It's two separate things. We're going to talk about that at some point in this school and make it real clear. But do you see, he breathed in them and said, receive Holy Spirit, but he still told them to tarry in the city and that, that the promise of the Father was coming. So there's an endowment with power, baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when he breathed on them and they were born again, now they have the nature of God. The day you eat the trees, the day you surely die. Jesus raises from the dead, man can live again. So he takes them back before the tree as if Adam never ate the tree and died. It shows you how sin is obliterated through the blood of Jesus that God can live in us again. That we're lacking nothing anymore. When he breathes on man, it's the picture of the garden before sin because the blood's there now, speaking, and there's no sin. That's powerful. Man, you think about that when you take communion. You get it? But isn't it amazing in John 20 when he did that, when he breathed on them, the very first thing out of his mouth is, if you forgive the sins of any. What's he saying? Walk in my love. See people like I've seen you. See people like I've seen you. No longer angry, frustrated, judgmental, first impressions, arrogant, proud, humanistic, comparison, deceived. Love people like I've loved you. See people like I've seen you. Follow my example. Become like me. Be my children. If you forgive the sins of any, they'll be forgiven. <laughs> so when Jesus forgave the sins of that man... Was God forgiving? Absolutely. Did Jesus the Lord instruct us to walk in the same manner and that God is in the realm of forgiveness so we're not presumptuous if we say, I forgive you? Who gave us permission? Who told us to live that way? It's amazing to me that he says the next thing, if you don't forgive, if you retain the sins of any, they'll be retained. And I'm studying and looking and I'm praying and I'm like, God, I don't get that. There's no permission for unforgiveness. You never say anywhere to not forgive. But yet, why is he mentioning if we retain? They'll be retained. Why? We're the body of Christ. He's at the right hand. His spirit's in us. We're to manifest his heart. If we let our hearts get hard, if we get legalistic, if we get religious, if, if we get outside of the heart of God, where's the heart of God going to come from? 
You see what happened in the church for years? The big legalistic thing and, and the wearing and the hair and the whole and the this and the that and the whole thing that happened and hurt lots of folks and all of a sudden people are judged instead of forgiven and all of a sudden we've made it works instead of grace and now we're afraid to preach grace because men will take advantage of grace, afraid to, afraid to preach righteousness because people won't change. That's, that's, that's craziness. That's unscriptural. It's what Jesus did and preached. See, we're debriefers. We're, we're heady. If Jesus, halfway through his ministry, would have debriefed, he'd have probably been discouraged and thought he needed some ministry school. Because what am I doing wrong? People aren't really jumping on the wagon here. I'm getting more controversy than I am converts. Must be able to do better. I probably need to revamp. That's what we do. Well, if this was God, it would be producing more for you. It would be working. See, we don't understand the working of Holy Spirit. Just think of the faith in Jesus' heart as a man when the, the people he's dying for just sentenced him to death. And he's dying to give them life. And he's trusting that if he be lifted up, he'd draw all men to him. He's trusting the wooing of Holy Spirit. He's trusting the evidence of love unveiled in the hearts of men. And that if he would do this and carry it through and not skip a beat and not change tunes, that, that one day we would understand the good news and repent. And on the first day of Pentecost, Peter's preaching. And he's telling them, you killed the Son of God. And Holy Spirit's touching that. And they're going, oh my God, we are guilty. We did. We murdered him. We killed our Messiah. And they're cut to the heart. On the first day of Pentecost, Jesus, faith before God, mercy triumphing over judgment. Not one curse word, blessing constantly, believing, faith, and trusting himself to the love of God and entrusting his sacrifice to, the, to, to, the, to God and to the people that they can be saved. Love never fails. Think about this. And the first day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, and Peter's endued with this power to be a witness, he's bearing witness. And the people that yelled Barabbas are going, oh my God. And they're cut to the heart. And God's not angry. God's not saying, you bunch of bums. What he's saying is, come into the light. See See and understand and be changed. So Holy Spirit's illuminating them through Peter's preaching. They're going, <gasps> and all of a sudden there's no denial. All of a sudden there's nowhere to hide. All of a sudden they go, <gasps> oh my God. <gasps> and they go, men and brother, it's, they're cut to the heart. It's a very emotional time. I'm convinced that there was people pulling their hair, laying on the ground crying. Come on. They weren't being convicted of shoplifting. They crucified their Savior. They judged the Son of God. <laughs> they killed their long-awaited Messiah, put him on the cross, and they fulfilled Scripture. And now they realize it. Come on, that's a pretty serious thing. Whoever realized you did something, and it hit you hard, and you saw it for what it was, and it really rent your heart. Who's ever spent time crying over something, and it felt like you were breaking inside for a season? That's actually an okay place for a season. When I got saved, I saw the wretchedness of my heart that night. Some people would have tried to talk me out. Now, brother, there's no condemnation. No, there's a place to see the wickedness. There's a place to take responsibility and actually take ownership for a, for a moment of, wow, this is the way I've been. And cry. I cried profusely. You don't have to cry. Sometimes it's just as simple as you're walking along. Oh, my goodness. Duh. That, what is, duh. That's change. That's repentance. Repentance is like, duh. What? It's not always, ooh, 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 come as I am. <laughs> Trouble is you keep coming as you are, you leave as you are. You, you, you got to change some things here. <laughs> if it's just about crying, I'm sorry, God, that's not repentance. Repentance is change your mind. That's what happened to them. So Peter, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? We're cut to the heart. What should we do? We killed our only hope. He came to save us and we killed him. And Peter literally, if you break down the language, literally said, change your mind and wish you didn't. Be baptized for the removal of your sins and you can all be sons, even though you killed the son. 
What an amazing answer. Sounds like Peter understood forgiving sin. Because he's saying, he's holding them accountable. Holy Spirit's illuminating them. And then when they repented, he didn't say, well, why should God let you in, you bunch of murderers? We followed him for three years. You saw him working through us. You bunch of idiots. And now you think God's going to forget it. You should have been in the circle. That would be retaining sins. And then guess what would happen to sins if he's the messenger? They're retained. It's a sad day when the body of Christ gets a hard heart. It's a sad day when we let life sculpt us instead of the gospel. Because if you start carrying little hurts around, it's amazing how foggy things get. That's why I preach so passionately and feel tears in me right now. Passionately on love and the heart of God. Because if you're carrying little issues, you'll see people through those filters. You've got little unresolved conflicts. You'll judge people based on that stuff. And you won't see them through the mercy of God. You don't remit sin, but you forgive sin. The blood remits sin when they repent. Look how John proclaimed Jesus when he came. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, the world didn't do anything. But sin, the fact that he came was hope for humanity. He takes away the sin of the world. The fact that he was here reveals the mercy of God towards men and how he views men. He's not holding men according to their trespasses. He's willing to show mercy. And as soon as your heart says, I'll receive it, everything's washed clean. But it's very important for you to see, well, Here's, here's what I want. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, something to be held to a grasp, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. See, sometimes we're so busy trying to represent God and we're really representing the way we see things, our own self-righteousness, sometimes the way we fight with judgment. We hold people to a standard that we're living by that isn't even bringing freedom and there's a hardness to our heart. So we judge instead of release. We've already got people accountable, and now we hold them extra accountable. You want them to jump through a hoop first or something, because that's how you live. Honestly, it's impossible to receive this and minister this, and, or receive this and walk in this and not minister it this way, because it's your freedom. The reason you forgive others, because you're forgiven. You're enjoying the, the freedom of forgiveness. You're not forgiving to be forgiven. Colossians says you forgive just as Christ forgave. You understand you're forgiven. And the response of your heart is forgiveness. So when people are having a hard time forgive, it actually reveals that they're not walking in a good place with God, receiving His forgiveness and His love. So they're seeing through that and they're judging through that. <laughs> if you have a hard time giving mercy, it's because you're not receiving mercy. You don't understand God's merciful towards you. Because if you ever taste the goodness of mercy, you'll want to pour mercy on people. Because you understand, you didn't have a second chance. You had a third, fourth, fifth, and tenth. And you're not going to say, well, if you really love God, you'll, well, you need to, well, God needs you to. That means you live that way. <laughs> and you're probably not as free <laughs> as one would think. <laughs> you all all right with this? I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. He made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man. Man, what a humility. He's the son of God. He's here as a man. Humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. See how it amplifies that? This is a horrible, humbling, most horrible affair. The worst it could have been. Cross. Can't even imagine. You know, it'd be better for somebody to just put, the, put a gun behind your brain stem and just pull the trigger. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't know nothing. But the cross is a hideous, horrible thing. They beat you and beat you and beat you. Can you imagine? That's where I, I, I think about this with the Apostle Paul. Paul wasn't just beat one time. He was beat a bunch of times. 
So after you get that first one, and you've been through it, and you know the second one's coming, think with me. Your flesh knows what's coming. You've been through one. And that first thing whacks you, and you know there's 38 more. Think with me. I think about that stuff. I watch the movie The Passion, and I'm just, I'm like, oh, put you to your knees. It's not just a gory film. It's the reality of his love. <laughs> I've heard Christians say, I, don't, I won't watch that. It's too gory. I'm thinking, no, you need to understand. It costs blood. It's not too, you need, you, we need to be sober to just not be in denial. Well, it's too gory. Well, the reality is his beating was probably worse than that movie. Scripturally. So if the movie's too gory, what's the reality of that day? And here's the deal. Jesus knew it was coming. And he did it. Oh. <laughs> And he wasn't escaping through death. He knew he was making it to the cross. He knew the beating wasn't going to kill him. So he couldn't even escape through death. Sometimes death is an escape. There's certain suicides that are just shrouded in, in deep deception and despair. And then there's other ones that are shrouded in severe selfishness. Severe. Well, I'll teach them a lesson. Well, I'll put guilt on them for the rest of their life. Well, they'll wish they didn't do me wrong. It's, it's just extreme self. It's just an escape. It's actually one of the weakest forms of this. It's deception. And we're not judging people that's been in that realm. What we're saying is that deception is out there. And the condition of the heart can fall prey to that stuff. And it's a gesture of self, extreme selfishness. Sometimes it's just despair and disheartenedness. But you can tell there's different motives behind things. That's why I talk about motives all the time. People do things for different reasons. You can't rise above your motive. Your motive's your ceiling. Your motive determines how high you fly. True? To the pure, all things are pure, and the pure in heart will see God. So he, he, he being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Uh, death on the cross. And then verse 9, it says, Therefore... Through this humility, through humbling himself under the mighty hand of God, through doing what God required of him and asked of him and predestined him for by fulfilling this, God has highly exalted him. Now, here's the cool thing about Jesus. I don't for a minute believe that Jesus' motive was, I'll do this so I'm highly exalted. He did this because of love. When you see the joy set before him, I don't think the joy set before him was the fact that he's just going to be name above every name. I think the joy set before him is the redemption of humanity. It's knowing that one day we could be saved and delivered and restored and reconciled. You're the joy. Isn't that amazing? And then we sit back and go, why would he find joy in me? It's because you're seeing yourself apart from how he's seeing you. That's, that's all. You're weighing the value of your life based on life lived, not life intended by him you're the joy see God highly exalted him his motivation isn't well I'll humble myself and one day I'll be in the top seat you know I hear people preach that stuff they say look you know I'm just going to go clean the toilets whatever it takes to get to the top <laughs> you'll probably be cleaning toilets for a while or you'll be self appointed one day <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, no, self-appointed on the top because you paid your dues. No, you, you do the toilets because you're serving. You're not doing the toilets because one day you're going to be on the top. He said, the greatest among you is the least of all. It's the servant of all. He didn't say you serve to be exalted. You serve because love serves. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. So there's this twist there. I've heard it preached that way. You know, you got to start somewhere. If you want to be in leadership, you need to start. Could, could wash the pastor's car. No, I'll wash my own car. You don't need to wash my car. <laughs> it says to clean the toilets. And I understand what we're trying to say, but if your motivation is cleaning the toilets to get to the top, there's no love in cleaning the toilets. You're just going through the rank. Clean the toilets because somebody has to and they get dirty and you clean them because they need clean. It's just simple. 
And God sees the humility of your heart and the pure motive of your heart. And, and he begins to see your selflessness and your servant heart and the pure heart. And he begins to lift that up and elevate that and impart to that and exalt that. Not because you're doing it to be exalted. You're doing it because of love and he exalts love. Just a thought. I've watched people struggle to get in places and they're doing what they need to get in a place. And I'm thinking, man, your need shouldn't be to get in a place. Your need should be to be in him and live from where he lives. And you'll be right where you need to be. I'm just really thankful for my own personal life because the last thing I ever, I vowed, there was a time in my life I vowed that I'd never travel. I didn't even understand itinerant ministry and wondered why people do it because I had a bad impression of it. It doesn't mean God's not in it, but I had a bad impression. Just because somebody mishandles something doesn't mean that it's wrong. There's a, we throw the ba- baby and the bathwater out a lot of times. I felt like itinerant ministry was a way of life, earning a living, a career. I, I, I saw people pulling and pushing and shoving. Pastor could bear witness probably. Ministries call the church weekly to find spots to preach and share their message. I can't even imagine that. I couldn't imagine calling a church and asking to go preach there. I would feel so presumptuous and so arrogant. I don't know how that works, but obviously there's people that have a conscience to do it. And, and, and if you do it through relationship, that's one thing, but a cold call. So I had a bad impression. I never could wrap my mind around it or faith and probably, probably started to judge itinerant ministry at large. Because of my bad experiences. And couldn't really see the. And I vowed in my heart. I remember saying well. You know. Because I actually it was said to me. You ought to travel. You ought to do this. And I was like yeah right. I thought we'll never do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I vowed. Yeah. I know one thing. I'll never do that. I'll go back into the workplace. If I go and keep pastor, and I'll go back in the workplace. Before I do anything. <laughs> and look what I'm doing. <laughs> They asked me to pastor back at my church, and the first time they asked me, my answer was, huh? Do you know what sometimes people do when they ask you to step into full-time ministry? Yes, because you've been waiting for it, pushing to get in there, and it's like your ships come in. I'm always nervous about that, especially if it brings extra joy. Your joy ought to come from him and salvation. Because if you can have extra joy that way, then if things don't work out, that means you lose that joy, and now you're bummed again. I just don't want to live that way. So it was healthy for me, because when they asked me, I was like, huh? And I said, I'm not a pastor. Are you kidding me? I'm a warehouse worker in love with Jesus. And they asked me again, and I said, no, quit asking me. I'd stop that. Well, we just think you. Third time they asked me, one of the board members came and said, listen, we really believe this is God. And my own pastor came and said, have you even prayed about this? I said, I haven't even thought about it. (laughs) But see, that was healthy. And he said, why don't you ask the Lord? God's so gracious. I didn't have to go in my bedroom to ask the Lord, but I just wanted to go seek him and be quiet. And on my way in the bedroom, I thought, okay, Lord, I'm going to ask you about this whole pastor thing. And I was closing the door, and I didn't even make it to the bed. I was going to turn and sit on the bed. I was right about here. His presence just came over me. And I stood there, and I went, he said, Dan, I want you to do this. It'll all be okay. I want you to do this. It's my grace. And I went, huh? And that's all I heard. I want you to do this. That's all I needed. I wasn't thinking that before. I wasn't asking, seeking, praying. I wasn't thinking one day I might be in ministry. I was already in ministry. I had 10 to 12 people call in my house a day, and I was a year old in the Lord. That's never changed. It's just increased. (laughs) I think I had 11 calls on Sunday. It's too many calls, guys. Everybody watching, it's too many calls. Call on the name of Jesus. Really, I'm leaving for New York tomorrow. There's so many people I'm not calling back because I can't. And the trap is that then they could feel hurt or like, well, you're preaching on love, and you can't even call me. Because you get so consumed with your thing, you think you're the only one. And not that you're not important, but when you're tracking down a person, you're setting yourself up. Because there might be a lot of other people tracking down a person. 
And that's my biggest struggle. I don't mind people calling. My biggest heart cry is people getting deceived because I haven't been able to call them back for a week or a week and a half and feeling like I don't care. They'll say, well, see, now even Dan doesn't care. Not understanding I got more going on than anybody realizes. That's, that stuff is happening all the time. You don't, you don't, people don't realize it. So you come to a church and you have need, you have expectation, you have impression, and you could set yourself up to be hurt. That's where we got to get free. I got people before services pull me, say, hey, can you pray for so-and-so? Look, I got a friend. Listen, these people travel far. They really need to spend time with you. That's constantly happening with me, and you're not aware of it. And I'm trying to cover and protect all that. It's grace that makes you okay in the midst of all that. Or you'd, you'd get overwhelmed. You'd feel like you're not doing well. You see what I'm saying? So it just happens. And I understand why it happens. But, okay. So God has therefore highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Those in heaven and on the earth and those under the earth. So that's pretty incredible highly exaltation. He's the name above every name. Every knee, not some knees, every knee. Oh, I love that. Now, our desire is certainly that every man repent like God's heart. It's not that we get the picture of some obstinate neighbor and start thinking, here, one day you'll bow. You know, Christians do that. They take it personal. They get offended. They say, one day you'll bow. You'll be on your face. They think that in their heart. And that they accept it because they have so judged the person. The person has so irritated them, so touched them, so rubbed them raw that, yeah, well, you can act that way now, but one day when he comes, it's just not a good place. If you get any enjoyment, just know that one day all the demonic power, devils, and everything are going to say, Jesus, your Lord, we knew it all the time, will be judged. So you can rejoice in that, you know. Revelations actually says that we're going to look and see him and say, he is the one that caused havoc. He's the one that caused all this unsettlement on the earth. It's him. And we're going to see him for what he really is in that day, the devil, and go, him? Boy, I want that revelation now. (laughs) Hello? (laughs) Not, oh, devil. It's like spider. (laughs) Man. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if we don't even get a freedom with the spider thing? Ah, spider! Oh, devil. Whatever. (laughs) Spider! (laughs) What, devil? Whatever. Spider! Mouse! Ah! (laughs) I'm okay with you on the table with your skirt up mouse, but you need to just say, what, devil? Whatever. (laughs) We can live with that. (laughs) It's like you. You're awesome. She opens my truck door yesterday. She's talking to me, and this spider's sitting on the panel of my truck. And she goes, ew, whack! <laughs> Slides it off, and all his guts are there. And she just wipes them away. I said, you are amazing. I love you. <laughs> she just didn't even play, man. She said, ew, Toosh. <laughs> Wiped the smear away. Kept talking like nothing ever happened. I said, you're awesome. <laughs> Because I, I, you look at her, you think she'd have went, ew, spider. She just, poof. <laughs> it was funny. The warrior in you rose up. Yeah. Look at her. She's got a little muscle sleeves up there. Look at that. <laughs> so every tongue. How many tongues? Should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Therefore, isn't that amazing? He exalts Jesus and puts him in his proper place and says, therefore, my beloved. Now, he directly talks to us in response because we're connected and we're one. Not always in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with a reverence towards God. Fear and trembling is what that means. Sober minded, keeping him in right esteem, proper place. Not growing slack and lack and weary in your heart and wanton and all that crazy stuff that can happen if you don't keep yourself stirred for it is God who is it God who works in who in you (laughs) isn't that amazing both to will and do for his good pleasure 
So you have to give yourself to him. If you incorporate him into your life, you're in trouble. That won't work. This, this, this won't happen. If you just pray a prayer to go to heaven, this won't be realized. But it's God working in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. So if we have the same mind that was in Christ, we're going to walk like him and fulfill his will. And God's going to be able to lift up and exalt who he is in us and manifest himself to the world. True? It's not just you sitting in a high place. It's God exalting and magnifying who he is in you. So because of this, because this is true, we're surrendered now. We're sold out to him. If he's working in us both to will and do them, we're bought with a price and we're not our own. Isn't that what the Bible says? So we're going to do how many things? All things. See, that's like an everything type of statement. Without what? Complaining. How many things? Wow. All things without complaining and disputing. That means grumbling and arguing. Why are we going to do that? He's actually talking about your life lived. He's not even talking about your congregation, church life. He's talking about your life. You're going to see this. He's talking about everywhere you are, wherever you are, especially your workplace. I'm amplifying that on purpose because you spend a lot of time with the world there. Why? Why is it important? Watch. Watch. That you may become blameless must be possible. It must be possible to live in a way for the world to sit back with their critical, unbelieving or misunderstanding heart and watch you. And down deep inside, even if they're accusing you deep inside, know you're blameless. When they're all alone, deep inside, actually know you've done nothing wrong. It must be possible, huh? For the world to sit back and watch you with their brow raised and find nothing against you. Oh, oh, it must be possible, huh, Dave? I promise you it's possible. I could tell you some cool stories. Stories that involve long periods of time, like two and a half years, six months, day in and day out with the same fellas. Why? Because you're living no compromise, there's no options, there's no multiple choice. Your eyes single, you're given, you're wholly given. You're in communion. All that is yours is my mind. And you're going to your workplace understanding God's working in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. And his good pleasure is to make his love and goodness known to the world through your life. It's not about how your work day is going. It's not even about how your bosses are treating you. When they're mistreating you, it's a time to walk in mercy. It's a time to manifest Jesus. When your co-workers are living obstinate and being unfair, it's a time to walk like Christ. And the devil will make sure to squeeze you hard enough to really see what's inside of you. And he'd love you to manifest something outside of Jesus and then say, yeah, some Christians see. Yeah, right. Well, you're not a good example. Well, people don't see God in you. And then you can't even lift your hands and worship Jesus because you're half condemned and you're thinking you're a hypocrite and you're wondering if you're even saved after a while. That's how the process goes. It's that crazy. So you don't put yourself in that place. And if you find yourself at work, see, this is why it's not legalism. It's why it's not kind of, if you find yourself at work slipping into weakness, man, you be humble and you take responsibility for it. And, and, and you say to whoever's involved, listen, I really apologize for yesterday. I let some things really get to me and God's growing me and I just appreciate your patience with me. But I'm letting you know I'm very sorry and that was outside of character. That was outside of truth and forgive me for the expression of my life yesterday. And you might be amazed that when you do that, the person isn't even thinking deep and they might go, huh? Because they thought it was just normal because that's what life is. And all of a sudden the integrity of what you're doing or they might have been criticizing and saying, yeah, Miss Christian, she just blew up or so-and-so Christian, he just said this and that. Oh, yeah, goody, goody guy, right. And now you're coming back broken and there's tears in your eyes and you say, I'm just asking you guys to forgive me. Man, yesterday I took things into a heart that I wasn't even realizing and I'm just growing and learning. Thanks for having patience with me. I really, really apologize for yesterday. There is so much integrity in that. People will hear that. You know why people will hear that? Because most people, when they act that way, they have a right to. And it's justified. And that's why there's no repentance, because they're letting people determine them and people mold them. And when they have a blowout, it's because you deserved it. You pushed me too far. But if you do that and go, oh my God, what have I done? And you get home and your heart breaks. My goodness, make it right with God. But there's times where you'll go and just make it right with man. This isn't a a real 
good testimony in a sense. It's just his experience. It doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a pride statement and it's, not, it's just what he said and it's, it's not a bash to the church. It's just sobering. I, was, I, was, I left my workplace for two and a half years and was pastoring full time. And I was there, I think I was there eight months to a year. And my phone rang and it was a former coworker that much after. And he said, uh, hey, and I was like, oh my goodness, hey, what's up? Why are you calling me? I didn't know what was going on. Because when I was there, it was, it was tense. He, it was tough. He had issues with God. His mom died of cancer. I got saved. We seemed to be friends, did things together. Things shifted, changed. He kind of pulled away because of my expression. And he kind of just didn't know how to handle it. And he just got mad. So he was a persecutor and he was mad a lot. He was about borderline to snap a couple different times and just yell. I could tell he was really fuming. He got up out of the room and left a few times when guys were asking me questions. We were talking and he felt cut off. He felt a lot of things. And I, I tried talking to him twice and it kind of blew up on his end. And I just thought, man, I didn't know what to do. It was one of them paradoxes. He calls me months and months, months after I left work. And he's stumbling on the phone a little bit and expressing his heart and it was amazing he brought me to tears he said I know it was really tough when you were here it's never left my mind isn't that amazing that he you think people are hard you think it's, it's, it's Holy Spirit it's the love of God working he couldn't get it out of his mind See, I finally just had to call you and I want to let you know now this is the part that I don't want you to hear that I'm highlighting and saying Yay, Dan. He said, you're the first Christian, confessing Christian I've ever met that lived up to everything he said. When you became a Christian, I was so mad because I have such a bad impression of God and Christianity. I just want to let you know I highly respect you and I'm sorry the way I acted. I was just acting out of my past experiences, but I realized all this time that has nothing to do with you and who you were, you're for real, and you have integrity, and I respect you. And I didn't try to preach to him. I, didn't, I just said, wow, well, thank you, that's amazing. And uh, he said, yeah, I, I appreciate the whole experience. I know it didn't seem like it then, but it hit me all this time later. I haven't stopped thinking about it, and I realized you've been everything you've ever said. And he was honoring that I lived my life, didn't just preach a doctrine. In fact, I didn't go in there preaching. They mostly were inquiring and asking because of my life. They were the ones initiating the doctrine. And then when I would preach, my life was there to back it up. And it gave them the ability to hear. When, now, I did a weird thing in my kitchen with the Lord. I think I wanted him to come and pat me and stroke me a little. I don't know why you get into that stuff, but I did. I was walking in my kitchen. I was like, Lord, you know, and I wanted the Lord to come and prophesy to me and say, you know, you did great, son. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but I don't even know why I get into it. But I said, Lord, did I do enough there? Did I accomplish what you wanted me to in those two and a half years? Lord, I hope. I mean, why am I talking about that now? Because if I didn't, it's over. Right. And the Lord really corrected me for, for what I was saying. He really did. He talked to me very strong. He shuddered my spirit. He does that to me every once in a while when I get weird like that. It brings me back to reality. Isn't it amazing without Holy Spirit, as strong as we seem, as together as we feel like we have it, without Holy Spirit, we'd be lost in probably a day. It's so mercy. It's so grace. So I cried and received what the Lord said, and I repented in the kitchen. I was like, enough with that. That was silly. What was I doing? Duh. Thanks, God. And he said, Dan, let me tell you what you've accomplished in there by trusting me and living in me. So it was God's grace that did it, but I was co-laboring. He said, you have lived a life that's made me real and manifest in me before their eyes, therefore unstopping their ears that were unable to hear. That's what the Lord said. I was so pumped. I thought if I live that way for two and a half years in front of them just for their ears to be unstopped, that's a big deal. Because now they can hear. Yay. And somebody is going to reap where they haven't even sown. But I did. And we'll all rejoice together. 
And I might not even know they reaped. But heaven knows I sowed. <laughs> Yay! So I'm not under evangelistic pressure. I'm not called to win my workplace. That's the way we talk. And then you're set up to fail because it doesn't look like you're winning. I'm called to love them and model Jesus. That's all I'm called to. <laughs> and as some turn, repent, I took some under my wing, began to disciple some, poured into some. There's people today walking in Christ, living in Christ because of my life in Christ in that season. There's people that came alive and got rekindled. There's a man over here in Gettysburg that's an elder in a church today because of our relationship then. Isn't that cool? So there was discipling and there was transformation. There was salvations. That was never my agenda. It was just go live and be real. Let my conduct be worthy of the gospel and consider others more highly than myself. Make sense? So we want to talk about that in the second half. Sue's standing in the back. That's my plug to let you guys go to the potty. So take a break. You got something quick? Real quick. Real quick. Yeah. Everybody Hold notice the shirt? It says, stand. It says, Oh, I love this shirt. Theft, read the word. Uh, the youth of the Harvest Chapel are selling this. They're on sale. Oh, look um, at that shirt. Look at Randy. He zooms right in on right. it. All right. Good. You're the best, Randy. Or two for 20. <laughs> all right. Uh, camera a little higher. You'll see Jesus if you go just a little higher. <laughs> yeah! Okay. Hey, it's power and love, and we're going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need to know. I just don't keep track of that stuff. I, yeah. It's on powerandlove.org where we'll be. I really don't know. She just asked me the same question because she has friends in New York. I said, you have to go to Power and Love. I have no clue. I'm meeting Jeremiah Grube at Christ Community at 9 o'clock, and we're heading to New York. So I'll find out when we get there. I just know Jesus is going with us, and there will be people there. It's really good. You know, I don't even pray about where I'm going. The Lord told me to go. I have a yes unless I hear no. I don't ask the size of congregations. I don't ask any background or any questions. That way when I go, I can just preach the gospel and not think that I'm projecting. Sometimes when you're at a home church and you know so much about so many people, when you're preaching, you start getting this feeling like people will think you're projecting and preaching on what you just talked about two days ago. And all you're trying to do is preach the convictions that are in your heart. But because you're aware of so many things, it feels like you're addressing it from the pulpit. I just have to know that I'm not in my heart. But I've seen the look on people's faces as a pastor already. They're like, oh, no, he's talking to me right now because of our conversation. <laughs> and sometimes I'm aware of that later after I've spoken because if I was before, my conscience sometimes wouldn't even allow you to be free. I was in a church service with a pastor that lost a child and had some other loss and had another child with other stuff going on. And I'm preaching passionately how we can't let anything change us no matter how close to home it is. And even if you lost a child and even if and it was so passionate, it came out of me. And if the world just peeked in and listened, they could have thought it was insensitive. But you'd have had to hear the whole thing. This pastor sitting on the front. I know him well. We talk about all this stuff. And, and he's sitting there crying and rocking and crying and looking and crying. And it never dawned on me. God had totally blinded me. And I know this man. The whole time I'm preaching totally blinded me to that everything I was saying was exactly what he's been through. When we were in the car leaving, he started weeping and sharing, thank you for your boldness to address all this from the pulpit in your heart. And, da, da, da. and all of a sudden, I began to cry and realized, oh my gosh, I remembered his whole story. I was completely blind to it the whole time. And I shared that with him and he just cried because he said the whole message put strength in him. He never once heard it as a confrontation or a challenge. And he just cried and cried and cried. And I thought, isn't that good how God is so amazing? I was in prayer and I saw the face of a lady in prayer. And I got a word for her and I was all excited to see her because I wanted to share the word with her. And I preached and preached and preached and preached and preached that day for a long time. And at the end, I'm closing up and I looked and the lady was sitting right where you are the whole time on the aisle. And I never saw her. And there was reasons why. Because of what I preached and everything. And there was a timing for it. So God gave me the awareness of it. But he taught me. The, and all of a sudden I'm closing. And I'm talking to the people. And I went. 
oh my goodness, you're the lady? And she looked at me, and immediately her eyes teared because God's spirit, and, and she's like, the lady? I said, I saw you, you in prayer. And have you been here the whole time? She said, yes. Oh my goodness, I didn't even see you. But I see you now. And then I shared what I saw in prayer, and she was undone, bawling. I said, step out, honey, I need to pray for you, and I prayed for her. But there was a reason, and I understood later why God blinded me to her then. But he does that to me as a pastor preaching all the time, especially when I'm at home, because I know so much. That used to happen to me when I preached at where I pastored for years because I, I was the people pastor. I knew everything in that room practically. And it was almost like you couldn't even preach without touching on things you talked about with people all week. And you have to just be pure and just preach. You're not trying to send a message from the pulpit saying, I hope you're listening over there. Because yeah. <laughs> that's twisted. That, that, see what I mean? I don't even know how I got on that. But it just all has to do with being pure. So the earth needs to see that we're blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. What's the generation that we live in without Jesus? Crooked and perverse, corrupted-minded, twisted thinking, right? Among whom you, who? You. You know, little songs, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world. Thank you. You're awesome. Oh, no, I received that from you. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Don't you thumb to your husband. <laughs> Bless you. I am about out. Hmm. You hear those little songs? You know? <laughs> the, the little children's song, This Little Light of Mine. So like, you can change the words. You know, this blazing fire in me. I'm going to let it burn. Whatever you want to do. But, you know, it ain't no little light. You know, I know how people get theological with all that. But there's a truth there. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Let it. Those are good songs. Yeah. Grow up singing them. They're supposed to mark us. Lift Jesus higher for the world to see. How do you do that? Through your character, through your nature, your disposition, through manifesting Him. It's not, we, we've turned it into proclaiming doctrine. Yes. Your life lived is way more powerful than your words preached. It actually, it causes people to hear the words preached. People could get offended by what I just said and say, no, the word's anointed, the word's powerful, it's sharper than any double-edged sword, et cetera, et cetera. But I've seen the word preached thousands of times without any heart of love, character, or anything, and I've watched it do way more harm than good. You let your light shine. You let your life be lived. Then your words carry the weight of the revelation you're walking in. It's a whole different realm. That's why Jesus opened his mouth. What did they say? No one has ever talked with this kind of authority. Why? Because he was talking out of who he was. Not just what God was saying. It's a different place. It's one thing for me to study my Bible and preach to you a good sermon because I read the book. It's another thing to preach out of the reality and revelation of my life. There's even a greater conviction in me, a greater faith, a greater compassion. There's a greater reality. It carries a different weight in the spirit, each seed producing after its own kind. Knowledge stimulates knowledge. Revelation can go into the hearts of people and birth. You get it? It's true. It's just true. We don't need good sermons. We need lives lived. And the life lived preaches way louder than any good sermon. <laughs> yeah, that's a good phrase. You'd be amazed on your workplace how people will... Somebody just said to me, I don't feel like I've talked enough at work, but people notice my life. They say, you're the one that always smiles. You're this, you're that. I said, no, that's a good start because now if they keep inquiring or ask or talk, when you begin to share, they have a life that relates to what you're saying. Rather than drop the bomb on them, all of a sudden, because you're convicted, I better talk to them about Jesus, and yet your life stumbles them, and they're like, oh, you go to church? <laughs> That's probably not the best thing. <laughs> probably 
finally get some things in order so that you don't shock them when you finally preach. Oh, you go to church. I'm telling you, I told you this last week. When I, when I was, became a Christian at work, I was so dra- dramatically transformed because I was just one of the boys for 13 years. And now I'm saved. And it freaked them out. But 11 Christians came out of the closet and stood up through my boldness and my life change and got so convicted they stood up and confessed they were Christians and I would have never known. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just saying it's possible to be 007, secret agent Christian, go to church and then go to work and be something else, but go to church and go to work and be something else and just fit in and go with the flow and let this environment mold you instead of go by the Spirit to your job. I used to be a Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. I was all miserable in any way, but when I'd go through the doors at work, I was really a mess because I didn't want to be there. So when I walked through the doors, I was like, here we go again. When I got saved, I couldn't wait to get there. It was the absolute truth. I'm driving in town heading, and I was so excited. I was like, what are you going to do today, God? This is so fun, man. And I finally see the value of those people in there and my job. And thank you for providing. And I was just the most thankful guy. And I'd go to work, and it would make some mad just because I was happy. At the end of my shift, I was so excited at the clock. At the end of my shift, and they're all like, yeah, another day at the grindstone, man. Yeah, we've got to go back and do it again tomorrow. And I'm just standing there, and they're like, what is wrong with you? You know? <laughs> they get mad at me. I'm like. <sighs> I had some amazing experiences at work. I was at break one day, and I'm in there, and people started talking to me about Jesus. There was a security guard. I had never seen him, didn't even know him. And, uh, yeah. It was amazing. Who's ever heard the theology that, uh, that, 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 that in the garden, Satan actually seduced Eve and actually came together with Eve and da, 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 and there's a whole twisted thing out there. Yeah. And, 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 and just that, yeah. And it was just this whole twisted thing. And, and, that's, and I heard of that before. And it was funny how I had just heard somebody telling me that people believe that or, or you know, preach that. The security guard, um, I'm coming out of the uh, break room and... He said, so you're a Christian, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, so you probably think like one day, you know, one, two guys at the millstone, one will disappear and one will stay. Two in the bed, one will leave and one will stay. I said, well, it's in the book. (laughs) And he got right in my face. He just twisted, man. It was crazy. And he said, he said, well, it's not true. And you're all going to hell. You're all going down. And he started telling me how he even, and I, and I went, wow. I said, man, I'm sorry for you. You really got some twisted thinking. You've got some major issues, a lot of pain in your life. Look at me. Jesus loves you. I said, what you're saying is not true. It wasn't shook a bit, and he vibrated. You could see rage in him, and I was young in the Lord, and I didn't know much what to do. I'd have probably handled it even a little different now, but didn't get threatened, didn't change composure, didn't bash him, didn't argue with him, just stood my ground and told him how much God loved him. You could say, well, yeah, well, what good did that do? He's doing this. See, that's the cynical part we don't understand. Time will tell what good that did. Because if I got intimidated, threatened, debated back into then flesh is just fighting flesh. You see? Sometimes because we don't see a reaction with our eyes, we have trouble believing with our heart. Well, if Jesus was in that position, he'd have been in real trouble dying and going to the cross. Because it didn't look like his ministry produced a whole lot in three years. He didn't have a whole lot of followers. There was 120 folks there in the upper room. Out of thousands and thousands and thousands healed. (laughs) Do you know there was thousands healed? That if they were written one by one, the world... So see, then we struggle with all that. But see, after he raised from the dead, who knows that immediately there were thousands added. And then thousands more. And then thousands more. See, if you get presumptuous back then, you're going to miss the working of Holy Spirit. And you're going to let intellect talk you out of faith. Are you following me? 
you really got to get what we're saying here right now. It's very important. It's what keeps you encouraged. When Jesus, watch this, Linda. When Jesus is on the cross, if he introspects his ministry and debriefs right now, it looks like he failed. They just turned him over to death. It doesn't look like anybody hardly loves him. Even the ones that were his faithful are scattered and afraid. And they're running for their own lives. He's teaching for three years, by example, loving not your own life. Telling him to not love. Rebuking Peter for having in mind the things of man. Telling Satan to get behind him the things of man and not the things of God. And all this stuff he's walking him through. And now he's finally at the cross. And even those guys scattered and ran. And it looks like failed ministry, guys. It looks like he needs to debrief and take some ministry courses and get some better results. But love is way deeper than that. Faith is way deeper than that. Come on. We've been trapped doing stuff and weighing it. Doing stuff and weighing it. Doing stuff and weighing it. Now we'll try this in ministry and this in ministry. And maybe we need to do this. And maybe we need to bring them in and do this. And the whole time we're doing that, we're revealing we're not rooted and grounded in love and established in faith. We're not settled. We're groping. When do we just believe that sincere love is having an effect in the community, that God's opening doors to authority and leadership, and all of a sudden some of the least and, and some of the most non-assuming are going to have the most amazing encounters and experiences and God is doing things because we're in position and we're becoming love. And it is impregnating our society because we're stopping for the one in front of us. Just the people I'm looking at in a community, if we all lived in the same town, if we just lived effectively in a lifestyle of love that was uncompromised, you would saturate your community with love. It's the whole will of God. But we have these Christians, and I'm not being mean right now. I'm being real. Christians still getting discouraged, disappointed, living in unbelief, getting caught up in the flesh, judging one another, hurt, false expectations, failed expectations, all kinds of stuff. And the whole goal of our instruction is love. All that other stuff is moved away when love is real. <laughs> okay. You guys all right? I, I'm, I'm not going to get... I, I, I'm feeling excited right now. <sighs> Do you get it? Because if you look at Jesus on the cross, it looks like he failed to, to intellect. Do you know what the Pharisees said? You know how shallow their understanding was? Huh, you saved others. Save yourself. You see where they're still trapped? He's not here to save himself. He's here to save them. And they're criticizing him and he still didn't change his mind. He's still here to save them. While they're criticizing him, he just kept loving. They're mocking him. He looks defeated. They're taking advantage of his situation, exploiting that, and being cynical and proud and obstinate. And it's just a mess. It's fallen flesh. It's its finest. And if Jesus doesn't budge, love never fails. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. But if I be lifted up, your spirit can touch them. One day they might see they can be with us. Oh, what a king. And we're taking words personal. And why did they say that? And they should have knew better. <sighs> and selling cheap every time you do that. Selling cheap, selling cheap, selling cheap. What do you say we follow Jesus? Get free. So no matter what people say, we understand. If they understood, they wouldn't be speaking that way. It's that simple. We understand if they understood, they wouldn't be speaking that way. That should cover everything, shouldn't it? So your heart and compassion be, should be for them, not angry towards them. Because if they saw what you see, they wouldn't be speaking what they're speaking. So you're not moved by it. Love never fails. But the effects of Jesus' ministry was yet to be seen. It's faith. It's seeds planted in the hand of God. Go to Mark 4 with me. Because we're going to teach here a little bit. Talk about just living effectively in a lifestyle of love. When you meet people. When you talk to people. <coughs> just goodness. Just kindness. Just good works to people. Just politeness. Uh, I, I, here's a good example. I, I, I love gardening. I'm an old school. My grandmother, I grew up, she was the canner deluxe. Do you know what I mean? 
making her own pickles, her own, she made her own ketchup. She, I would go to grandma's house just to look at her shelf and say, grandma, can I have like that? Sure, Danny boy, I'll get, I'm like, oh. And I, grandma was, I was a city boy, so when I was seven and eight, I was walking all over the streets. It's a funny think about it now, because like my little granddaughter, she's five and a half, six. I was blocks away from the house. I would walk down to the park three blocks away when I was six, because I was city. And it's not always a good thing. I was, I was, I was from here to this table when my nine, I was eight, my cousin was nine when he got hit and killed by a car. Was we this far away? We were ready to race to his house. Beat you to mom's, yeah, right. Because I knew I was faster than any kid and he was ahead of me and my brother was on his bike. He shot across the street and Donnie took off and took three steps ahead of me and I went like that in the car. It was a drunken man, 70 mile an hour down Market Street, just pow. But we were just out like that, living that way. And uh, yeah, it was, it was something. And. Uh, I got hit at the same exact intersection going to football practice and was underneath the car at the same exact intersection. You think there isn't stuff that tries to track and wow. do stuff. I was just walked across the street and I wasn't paying attention and there was a kid with me and he was on this side of me and the car was stopped to park. And because we were talking, I never looked up the light. I figured he stopped because the light was red. And when I walked past his car, car's coming full speed, and I put my football helmet down. Didn't do so well against the big, fast-moving linebacker <laughs> called Carr. <laughs> it blasted me, man. Knocked me over, and I looked up, and I was looking up at the bottom of the car. And I was so nervous, I, I crawled out from under the front of the wheel. And I took off just walking down the road. Everybody thought I was in shock. I was like, look, I just want to go to football practice. <laughs> It's the same exact, I was, I was in the same exact spot where Donnie got killed. Isn't that amazing? It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. And I was, I was young, real young. I was playing midget league football. I was really young, probably 10, 11, 12 maybe, 11, something like that. And this poor little friend of mine, little black fellow from the city, we were good buddies. He was younger than me, and he'd walk to practice with me every day. And he really honored me and, and loved me playing football, and he just was neat that he could walk with me. And we'd always, I was his, just his friend. He sees me go under the car. Fear, panics, runs to football practice, tells everybody I'm dead. <laughs> and I, I'm up out of the car. I'm trying, yeah, because I'm raised from the dead. It was prophetic, huh? Devil tried to kill me, the young boy prophesied. You know, I'm dead. No, I'm alive. And uh, I am he that was dead, but am alive forevermore. No, but I, I was walking, and this man grabbed me by the arm and said, Son, I said, Look, sir, I'm totally okay. I'm really fine. I just want to go to football practice. Son, you can't go to football practice. You were underneath that car. We got to take you home. I said, Sir, I'm totally fine. I know I am. You're in shock. You're just nervous. You're just, it's emotions keeping you okay. We got to get you checked out. You got to go to the hospital. I am not going to the hospital, sir. I said, at least take me home to my mother. She'll tell you that I'm okay. She's my mom. So <laughs> they, they took me home and told mom that where I got hit. And I looked, I said, it's the same spot where Donnie got hit. And I'm sorry, mom. And we were talking. She's like, oh my gosh, you know how moms, moms are like, oh. And they give you a double, triple hug because you're there. They know what you've been through and they squeeze. They, you're okay, you're fine. But they give you the double, triple hug because they know the story. And they're like, oh, my son. Ah! And I'm like, mom, I'm fine. Nothing's changed. You know, that happened. Me and the kids were in an accident. My wife knew. We called home. We'll be home in a little. We're, but she was waiting at the door when we came home from the accident and met us at the door running, giving us all triple, double hugs. And it's just funny how we are. And... Uh, I told mom, I assured mom I'm fine, and I ran to football practice. I go to football practice, nobody's practicing. They canceled practice, everybody's in circles mourning my death. <laughs> They're all mourning my death. They're all in big circles, all sad. People are crying, kids are crying. And they're all, they canceled practice. It was too emotional, nobody practiced. And here I come late, <laughs> half hour late with my football helmet running across the field. And the coach looks up and he goes, and he screams the little boy's name and says, laps now, don't stop running till I tell you. And this kid goes, at least he's alive, at least he's alive. 
that poor kid was running. I said to coach, I said, please stop that kid. I really did get hit. I got it. He stopped him from running. I said, he just panicked. What do you expect? You know, but he yells his name and laughs. And the kid said, at least he's alive. He's, I love you. He didn't say that, but he was glad I was alive. So he didn't care. He's ready to run. But all the kids were like, what's going on? And I told him what happened, but I said I was the whole way under the car, and they're all freaked out, and then we practiced. But it was just funny. <clears throat> I, I, the only reason I told you that whole story was because of the way it was in city life. So, so, so I, I grew up walking everywhere. When I, was, when I was seven and eight, I'd go to grandma's all the time, all the time. And, man, it was nice. I got so into the story. There was a reason. The canning thing, because I'm a canner. Like... I really like to can. So, yeah, like last week, I did 20-some jars of peaches. After school, I run home and did peaches. The week before, I, I did 20-some I did jars of tomatoes all by myself. Isn't it awesome? So, yeah. So, and I don't know why I was, I, there was a story connected with canning. But uh, it had to do with seeds and stuff. It'll come back to me. I don't ever lose my train of thought like that. Holy Spirit, where am I? Help me. I never feel this lost. <laughs> I know I'm in Mark 4. I'm here. Let's go to Mark 4. Maybe I'll get redeemed. But anyway, I canned a lot last week. <laughs> I have never felt this lost in the pulpit ever. This is funny. I am so lost right now. I don't even know where I'm at. I have no idea what I was saying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Somebody pray the prayer of salvation with me now. <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> I was going to make a cool comparison and analogy. I know it was good. It's somewhere buried deep in the heart of God. <sighs> Let's go to Mark 4. Oh, my goodness. Help me, Jesus. Grandma. <laughs> Do you know what's funny? My, uh, not funny, haha, -ha, but my, my grandparents passed in August. This past August, I'm 49, and I still had my grandparents. Isn't that amazing? So it's not a sad thing for me. I can talk about it easy. I, I didn't even cry until I was asked to do their gravesides, both their gravesides. What an honor. My aunt called me bawling and said, would you please do their s services? Then I cried a little, just because of honor and love. I don't remember one time my grandfather raising his voice at me and being frustrated in my whole life. Not one time. That's pretty incredible. 99 and a half. That's why I was so thankful. Six months from 100. Oh, yeah. Oh. But three weeks later, Grandma, 93, almost 93, said, I just don't see any reason anymore to be here at this stage of my life. I so miss Carl, and we were married 70 years, and things are so different. And I think I'm ready to just go be with Carl, Dan. I talked to her a little about incentive, purpose, being somebody's friend. You'd be, you'd be such a good friend to somebody. Talked to her about this prayer intercession, just some purpose. I know, I hear what you're saying, but there's just something about me and Carl and him being gone and being one with him all those years. I don't, like three days later, she just stopped breathing. Wow. Awesome. Gone. So it was something. But received a lot from my grandparents. I always said I had storybook grandparents. Like, nurse, like storybook grandparents. I really did. Amazing grandparents. So I don't know what I was, there was a cannon thought there, but there was something there, man. Last week, God, I do, I give, I give so much away. <laughs> you think that's what it was? <laughs> Just to give some away. Look at verse 26 of Mark 4. Man, when you approach people in public, it could be the smallest thing. It, it, you just don't understand what people are going through, how God's working in them. You don't have to figure it all out. Just be sincere. Let your love be sincere without hypocrisy. 
you'll find there's testimonies down the road that say, oh my goodness, God loves me so much. I didn't know what was going on, but one time there was this lady, she walked up to me and said, and it struck me, but it didn't click. And then a month later, somebody came up and, and then it started to make sense. I thought, oh my God, is this you, God? And then this man walked up and, oh my God. And now they're born again and they're sharing their testimony. I walked up to a lady in a grocery store to pray for her and encourage her. And she said, now this is really strange. I have never been prayed for in public. And I was out of town. It wasn't in, in my hometown. I, I, she said, I have never been prayed for for anybody in public in my life. And nobody ever just approached me to pray. And she said, you are the third person in a month. Wow. That's good. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. That encouraged me in a lot of things. But it's making a statement to her. Yeah. You see how it works? Yeah. And it might look small on the outside, but it's not. That's where we'll be deceived. And we think what we're doing is insignificant. And then we do that debriefing thing and think we need to have a better plan. Well, you know, I know what we'd have done with our ministerial prowess nowadays. We'd have sat Jesus down and tried to help him. Because we do it all the time. We'd have tried to tell him why he could be more effective. <laughs> Wouldn't we? At the end of his ministry, we'd have weighed fruit and probably tried to tell Jesus why he could have done a whole lot better. <laughs> yeah, oh God, we won't even touch that one. I'll leave that one on the front row. <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> That's between us, guys. It's all right. But here's what Jesus did his whole ministry he sowed seeds. His whole ministry, he sowed seeds and ministered the truth into the hearts of men so that Holy Spirit could work and lead men concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. You get it? Holy Spirit's the one that saves people. You don't save anybody. You give them a real encounter with Him, with love. You sow seeds, you water seeds. Sometimes you're watering instead of sowing. It doesn't matter. You don't have to even know that. Be sincere and love people. Babies are conceived in a womb and they camp out there for a while and there's a time to be born. God is cultivating and nurturing hearts. You say, yeah, but time is short. Well, don't let that intellect take you apart from faith and the mercy of God. He didn't blow the trumpet yet because one more might be saved. You be patient. You keep doing what God's telling you. You live upright and be sincere. There is people that are trying to get people saved, and, and, and especially in a workplace, and tell people, I worked with folks like this that took a stand in religion and tried to convict people and tell them why they needed saved and their very life was the reason people wouldn't receive their word. Their attitude, their condemnation, their very life. I had a real breakthrough with the guy when I worked because I had a guy like that at work and then he came and talked to me right away because he wanted to know what's going on with me and he wanted to kind of set me straight in a couple things. and. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know nothing. I was just saved, and all I was was just a smiling mess, and I was just at peace, and I knew God was real. and So I couldn't really hold a conversation at the time. It was months down the road. He came crying and said, I've been a confessing Christian for 20 years, and your life makes me cry. I'm so convicted. I've questioned what I even am. That's what he did. I said, well, don't be condemned, friend. Just... Man, if you're getting a good message through this, learn and grow and, and live for him. He can make up for anything. You don't, don't beat yourself up. Thank God you're hearing truth if this is truth to you. And I didn't know how to respond to him. But my life changed his 20-year mind. And I was just, right? So God is birthing people. God is grooming people. God has them in his spiritual womb. You'd be amazed what's going on in the minds of men all the time. Just because God loves people, there's conviction on the earth. When I wasn't right with God, I knew it every day. Why? Because the I love you never turn off. 
If he turned it off by, by sheer instinct like a brute beast, I'd have walked right into darkness, the Bible says. But God just whisper. Love it. I get so mad sometimes at conviction. When I was 19, I threw my Bible against the wall, screamed at it like it was a man. I said, I wish I didn't know what you said. You make me so mad. You're always in my face. You're always in my way. I'm screaming at my Bible as a 19-year-old kid in my bedroom. Loud screaming. You're always in my face. You never let me do what I want to do. You're always in my way. And I slammed it against the wall. 19 years old. What a knucklehead. God said, oh, you little goober, I'm going to eat you. <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Thank God he didn't do that. Thank God on the day that I repented, he didn't say, oh, back now, huh? That's how it worked for you the last bunch of years. You think I forget what you said when you were 19? He didn't hold me to that. He didn't bring that up. I just remembered it later and it made me cry all the more. Because you can't change God's love. Who knows I shouldn't have did that and didn't need to do that. Who knows God's way bigger than what I'm going through in my emotional ridiculousness. <laughs> Who knows God is way deeper than my emotional outburst. Who knows that Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, is still chiming before the throne. Oh, who knows the blood is speaking? The blood is saying, I love that boy. He's not what he seems. Don't take him face value. There's more to his life than that. Yay. That's what the blood's saying. It's called mercy. Isn't it amazing? The night I got saved, God didn't come and say all kinds of other stuff and hold me accountable and my heart was already broken he doesn't my heart was already repentant it, I was a changed man just because of what I saw and yielded to he didn't have to bring that up he just moved it away isn't that sweet so we ought to let it be all moved away amen just a side thought the kingdom of God verse 26 mm hmm there's so many good things in this chapter. Oh, I'm backtracking here. It's not healthy. Because <laughs> at the time, because <laughs> this is my last day this week, I didn't get too far today. Let's just, let's just look at verse 21. So he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a lamp, under a bed? It's to be set on a lampstand. A light's lit to shine, right? So, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It's not to be, is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which not be revealed, nor, and I understand the context of what he's saying right now, uh, but the bottom line is what you can pull out of this is you're lit up to shine. Hidden will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to the light. So if you want to actually look at that in your Christian life and confession, you haven't come to the light to be hidden. You've come to the light to be seen. And you're not trying to turn yourself on and shine on people. You have a relationship with God and you're lit up in Him and you're walking in love and that's light in a dark world. It's His divine nature in the midst of the corruption of lust and selfishness. It's considering others more highly than yourself. It's living in goodness and kindness and tender mercies. It's manifesting the nature of God. It's doing things sometimes for people, and they can't get over why you would do it for them. It's people that have mistreated you, and all of a sudden you just step in and, and don't even think deep about it, and you just help them get through something or help them with something. And all of a sudden they're thinking, why are they helping me? Because they're expecting you to have feelings because of the way they've been. And that stuff crushes stuff. Love and light and all that. Oh, it crushes stuff. I said to the guys that I worked with, and I said, man, you guys are still mocking and persecuting, but I know when you get alone, every one of you, when you're away from the strength of your numbers, your wheels are all spinning. Your lives are all in front of you. And they're all just like, 
When your co-workers are doing that, Jesus is in the room. When they're not cynical. When you're talking and they're not back talking and they're just quiet looking to the ground and they don't say a word. Jesus is in the room. I promise you. If you ever worked in a warehouse, you know what I'm saying. Or around just a bunch of guys. The kingdom of God. We're to understand the kingdom. He's explaining the kingdom of God here. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. The kingdom of God is amazing. Why? Because love never fails. God's the same. He's a rock. He, he's, he's, he's unchanging. He's unshifting. There's no turning or shifting of shadow with God. Man. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed would sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head. And after the full grain, when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. We're scattering seed, going to sleep by night. Things are growing. We're not even sure how, but Holy Spirit's working. You didn't come to the knowledge of truth and get saved just because one day you said, I think I'm going to live for Jesus. Through the course of your life, you might be amazed how God was sowing into you from way back and working in you. And sometimes it was making you more frustrated. And sometimes you got all the more rebellious. And sometimes you this and that. But God never relented and never backed off on love. And he wooed and grace. And he talked and he spoke wisdom. And he changed your mind. And he drew your heart to him. And you surrendered. It's the working of his spirit. It's not because you woke up one day and said, I think I'm going to pull it all together and just live for Jesus. No man comes unless he's drawn. Of course, clay has to yield. You yield to the drawing. The end of Revelation says that all who desire, all who are thirsty and all who desire, God builds desire in you. He woos you to where his goodness works desire in you. You get it? It's just really good. And he doesn't stop that. I don't believe he stops that in a man ever until he passes. I believe God's doing that while they're on a deathbed. Even if they were as hard as could be right up to the moment they die, I believe there's some kind of wooing, some kind of drawing, some kind of opportunity. I really do. I, I never assume somebody's lost. I just always rejoice in God's mercy. I never say, well, they're lost. You lose a loved one and believe they're lost, that's a sad day. It doesn't profit anything. Rather, I'd exalt in the mercy of God, and time will tell, but all the more reason for us to live sober and run the race where they have a prize. Instead of getting depression over the loved one you think is lost. Nobody knows what's going on inside of people and where their heart is right up until that moment. Nobody knows. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is so amazing. And I have heard so many testimonies. And I've seen him do so many incredible things. I could tell you deathbed stories that boggle my mind that I don't even totally understand. Where faces lit up. Where they died with smiles. Where you sing a song and at the end of the song they die. I could tell you some stories. They're amazing. One lady that was afraid to live her salvation because she was abused her whole life and she couldn't separate and understand how she could live and, and, and she had so many hurts in her life and she backslid and Jesus healed her and she backslid and didn't even run in the healing. She backslid. Now she's condemned. Now she's dying of another disease. It's a different separate case but it's killing her fast and she's feeling like it's judgment because God healed her and she didn't live for him. She backslid and, and she, she just said, I just want to receive his love. I don't even want to be healed. I'm afraid to live this life. I just want to know his love again. And I'm like, honey, we're going to pray. You can be healed. You can know his love. And you can live long and leave a legacy. You know how I think. I'm going to get you healed. Said, I want you to pray for healing. I'm afraid to live my life. It sounds like a weak place, you know. And, and yet her heart was saying, I never felt anything like six months ago when you prayed for me in church. I thought, I thought everything was going to be good. How can I backslide? Ah! This is real to her. 
She felt like she failed him. She felt like she did injustice. She felt like she said that was the most loving experience. She had never known love. How could I walk away from what was so real? How could I let other things get in the way? Oh, I don't even want him healed. I just want to know that he's not disappointed. I just want to know. She let her dying, crying like that. And I'm thinking, honey, it's a, it took off my coat. We're going to pray. And I prayed, and the Holy Spirit came. So tangible. It was so incredible. He's, and she went, oh, oh, oh. And she kind of just didn't talk no more and just sat back and closed her eyes. It looked like people get slain in the spirit, whatever. She was just, and I thought, nah, it ain't a time to talk. I made sure she was decent, put blanket, just covered her up, tucked her in. And I backed out of the room. I get a phone call 40 minutes later that she's dead. And I'm like, what? I was so sure she was healed. Her sister called. She died. I just had the most incredible experience. She didn't even know I was there. I said, well, I was just there. I must have just missed you. She says, all I know is I walked in and Sissy was laying in the bed. And I never saw a human being's face like that in my life. It looked like there was a light inside of her face. (laughs) And she had her eyes closed. And she had a smile on her face with her eyes closed. And I walked over and I sat gently in the bed and I took her hand. I said, Sissy, I said, what, what's going on? And she said, oh, and she called her by name. Honey, just sing my favorite song. Just sing me my favorite song. Please sing my favorite song. And her sister said, Jesus loves me, this I know. And when she got to, for the Bible tells me. She's sitting there with a light in her face, and she went. She was gone. I can't even wrap my mind around that. The mercy of God, how he bears up in people's weakness. How he's not mad at her. Well, rise up and be a warrior. You need it. Somehow her heart was so sincere, so desperate, and yet didn't understand. And God met her right where she was at. And somehow he received her with joy and light. Was it the will of God to go that way? Did she have to die? I don't believe any of that. I can't even explain it. I don't even wrap it around my belief system. To, but somehow he was revealed. Somehow his glory. Somehow something happened amazing. That's pretty incredible. Because when people die like that, I, I don't like that. I feel like she's, she was only 53, guys. She didn't have to die. I saw another lady with understanding choose to die, didn't want healed, said, I'm ready to go. I said, how do you know that's your choice? That's not your choice. Where's that your choice? I just want to go. All my kids are saved. I said, well, somebody else's kids might not be. <laughs> that's selfish, honey. What are you doing? Well, don't pray for me. I don't want healed. I want to go. She said, I'm waiting for this bus to pick me up. They said, I'll be dead in 48 hours. I'm not going for help. My heart's leaking and I'll be dead. I said, honey, I don't know that that's your prerogative and privilege to make that decision. See, she was in a different position than this other lady with the weakness, the past, the pain, the backslid. And it was a whole different, you, every situation is different. And that lady suffered for a whole week, went into a comatose state and was wrenching in pain and her family was getting shook by it watching her because they were told, do nothing, let her die. She said, I don't want any, nothing. I'm just going to go. Jesus is going to take me. And then they started to wonder, why isn't he just taking her? Sometimes you don't have the privilege to make that decision. When you're 70, God's not saying, okay, you reached 70, now you're going to pull the plug. All my kids are saved. I got everything I want. Well, maybe it's him that works in you to will and do for his good pleasure, and maybe it's not your choice at that point. So you can step out of grace, and I'm telling you, it was no grace in her death. But there was a ridiculous grace in this other lady's death, and she was backslidden and afraid and crying and broken, and somehow there was unbelievable grace. So you don't want to make doctrines out of that stuff because it will affect your belief system, but it's amazing. What I'm highlighting is God's incredible mercy and unfailing love. Amen? Amen. Did you have something? Uh Uh-oh, you made your eyes big.
You made your eyes big. I thought it was going to be a deep question. No, it's not even a question. Okay. I just, and this isn't about death. This is more about life. I just thought I needed to share this with the class um, on Saturday evening when we were here at this healing service. Uh, my mother was here, and yeah. she was in a wheelchair. She, you know, for people that don't know, she doesn't have a hip. She hasn't had a hip for nine years. Um, they had to re take it out. They get, gave her a hip replacement, but it didn't take because she has lupus, and prednisone just ruined her bones. So that's why she don't have a hip. So because of not having a hip, her leg, her one leg, is like five to six inches shorter because there's nothing there. Because there's no ball, no there's cushioning, nothing, no nothing. There's nothing there. It's just there. flat bone. In right. There. There's n there's so collapse there. the hip joint, that's what she has. Yeah, she has nothing there. Okay. Um, they couldn't replace it because she had so much infection, she almost died. So there was no way of, and, and actually the, the doctor said she could not live by herself, which she does. However, she came Saturday evening, and when you had called people up, you know, for prayer. Sure. She wheeled herself up. Wow. And she went to, I don't know her name. Trisha. Trish. And yeah. I didn't pay much attention because I was with a friend. And later on, she said, Patty, come here. She says, you got to see this. Her leg grew all but a half an inch to meet the other. I mean, and she was like, couldn't I mean, I know it. I, I know my mother. <laughs> and to see something like that was just amazing. Now, she's 80. And instead of... They, she's, you know, depressed. You know, she can't do a lot. She, you know, now since Saturday evening, I call, I've call. i been calling her, said, how are you, Mom? Because she's been in so much pain, biking in the hole in nine yards, getting mm. shots, everything. Yeah. Even though she don't have a hip, the scar tissue, all that stuff. She says, I said, are you in pain, Mom? She says, no. She's, I said, she says, I don't know how to explain it. It's a weird feeling. I said, hmm. I said, you know, I can't see God making your leg grow if he's not going to do something else. What good would that be? Oh, your leg grew. Okay, well, so what? You know, he's got something else in store for you, Mom. And she said, I believe it. Before she was like, she wants us to bring her walker into the house. She, she drives on an electric wheelchair. She wants us to bring the walker in because she wants to try to walk. Mm. Now, this is a woman who has to transfer all the time. Right, she right. wants to try to walk. With no hip, yeah, you couldn't walk, so she wants to try. She feels like God is recreating and building a hip in her. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, she hasn't told many, you know, anybody about it, and there was two people in where she lives says, what happened to you? You look so different. Isn't that something? Mom says, what do you mean? Your face looks different. Everything looks different. This morning she says to me, I was on my way here. I said, Mom, how are you feeling? She told me the same thing. I said, well, she says, Patty, more than that happened to me Saturday night. She said, I can't explain it quite right to you, she said, but I have such hope. Oh, my goodness. I know. She says, I have such hope, and I, I, I have a better outlook on things. And, I mean, she was just like, but before, the day before, I was, what are you doing, you know? Right. She, pity, you know, well on me. I mean, but I understand it because of have to be by herself all the time. But it's awesome. Change it. Yeah. I, I remember mom sitting there. She was really listening to the message. She says, she I've never seen a man like that in my life. Well, she was. <laughs> That's what she said. Yeah, neither did I've most never people. never seen no. a man. <laughs> she, she, was, she was like this. At the, that service, she was like, she just had a look on her face like a child. Yeah. And she was hanging on every word. Isn't that cool? So it's truth, and it's God, and he's ministering, and he's sowing seed. So here I am. Look at this. Look at this. The testimony is so timely. Watch, because we're wrapping up here. I'm just preaching. All I'm doing is preaching, but look what God's doing. Way bigger, way bigger than you can imagine. Sowing seed, right? She's praying. We see what we see, but there's more that meets the I, we had to always be encouraged and have so much hope and be excited because the kingdom's in us and we're giving him to people. Amen.
I know a testimony of a girl that was born without bones from the waist down, was prayed for, and in three days, three days, she had complete bones from the hips down in three days. It wasn't right away, but on the third day, she got up and walked and never had bones in her body, was laying limp for four years. She was a four-year-old. It wasn't a lady. It was a four-year-old girl, and uh, she just got up and walked. Three days, no bones from here down, born without any bone structure, just limp flesh. And Jesus built bones in her for three. Now, he could have just went and did it, but it's three days he did it. I, there's just something cool about it. It's just yay. So we just always stay faith. So here's the deal. Let's just do this. So what I'm doing is I want to stay real simple on just loving people and touching people. You're not trying to win the whole world and turn the world upside down. You're not just thinking big things, trying to get, just get the paralytic healed. And that's, I understand the paralytic needs healed. There's a place for us to continue to walk in that anointing and see that thing happen more. But let's just grow in love. Let's start loving people and touching people as we go. And, 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 and being encouraged to asking people if you could pray for them. The worst they can mostly do is tell you no. I mean, I've had people say nasty things to me at times, and I'll just come back with something so soft and so humble, it'll actually make them feel bad for acting that way, and they'll even let you pray for them. <laughs> I can't tell you how I many. I had one lady say, boy, you're really nosy, aren't you? Like, you need to mind your own business. Why do you care? Why are you so nosy? I said, honey, I'm not nosy at all. I said, Jesus changed my life a few years ago, and he's caused me to really love people and see the value of people. I was hoping I could pray for you. And as I was talking, I realized she grew up in the church and had left her heart get hard through life and actually had Christian roots. And all of a sudden, she was affronted for her attitude and disposition and actually felt terrible in her mind and heart for how she just treated me because of my intention. And it, it actually revealed where her life had drifted. But I didn't, I didn't address all that. I saw that. I knew God was addressing that. My place is to just love her, not set her straight. So I just loved on and prayed for her. Jesus came, his presence came over and healed her. It was beautiful. And she lashed out at me and still got healed. Some people, one man, I asked him to pray. He said, man, get out of my face. I don't even know you, man. He was in the city. And the Lord said, go pray for him. He gave me a word of knowledge. I shared the word of knowledge and he, he blew me off even though I knew yelled at me he said and I said listen man this is true I know it's true about you I heard it in my heart man what don't you understand get away from me I don't even know you man get out of my face that's how he talked to me and I said well no it doesn't work like that it's not that simple my heart's moved towards you God has his eye fixed on and a lady intervened came to the doorway and said man how do you know about his leg and I said you caught that didn't you I said, he's really, he's obviously been through a lot and he's an angry man right now, but he's missing the whole point. You actually saw that and heard that. Do you know about it? Can you help me? And he's just sitting there like this. <laughs> and she told me the story and then she yelled, him, yelled at him and said, why are you acting like this? Can't you see this man's here for good? It was like a movie. It was like a fairy tale movie. It's the city. All of a sudden there's three more heads in the doorway. And they're all like, and I'm talking, and this guy's still me. And, and they said, why are you treating him like that? This man's here to help you. And da, da, da. you need to knock it off and let him pray for you. Can't you see? He's a man of God. He's sent from the Lord. They're his friends now who aren't even thinking Jesus are telling him this. So here's what he does. All right, man, all right. Just go ahead, man. Go ahead, pray. That's what he did. Now that's not all that anointed. And if you're a woo kind of person, you're in trouble. Because the music's not right right now. <laughs> said, Go ahead and just pray, man. So with all my heart, I took the front of his knee and leg and prayed. He was hit by a car when he was six or eight. Broke his femur bone and didn't have medical care and stuff. And just kind of, they nursed him and stuff. And he, he walked real bad. So when I asked him to get up and walk, he, he was like, that's how he walked. It was that dramatic. And I was like, oh, my goodness, my heart broke. I said, is that the way you've always walked? That's it, man. That's, that's what I got. That's the way it's been forever, man. He's just mad. And his friends, I looked at him, and they said, he's always been like that since a little boy. 
something broke in me. Here's this guy being so obstinate. He doesn't understand. Life has taken its toll. Love's right in front of him, and he can't recognize it, and he acts as if he doesn't even want it. So everything has a catch to it. Everybody has their own agenda. Everybody's living in their own little world, see? And that's not true in Christ. And something broke in me. I just started weeping. I don't even know this guy. And I slid in on my knees. And I started to cry. And I wrapped my hands around his leg right here. And with all my heart, I began to pray, leg, you respond and be whole. Thank you for your love, God. And I'm crying. This man's standing looking down at me, who he's blowing off and treating terrible, crying for him. And I don't even know him. Something happened. It's very powerful in the whole atmosphere. And he just broke. And I leaned back and I said, turn and walk for me now, sir. I'm crying. Turn and walk. He's like undone. You could tell he was shocked by this whole event. He turned and he went. Like that, and I said, I stood up. I said, "Yeah, you feel that, don't you?" It's just, it's neat. You're very, because he's just all over me like that. He said, "I said that." <laughs> he said, "He said, he said, what?" I said, "That's Jesus, friend. That's my Jesus. He loves you too." I went. He, he's looking at me. He come towards me. I come towards him. Now he's holding me and won't let me go. It's like a movie. It was, it was ridiculous, like a movie. It was like, so now there's other people in this other doorway. There's this lady in the chair that I really didn't notice a door down, watching the whole thing. And she's just sitting there. And she's been inundated, arthritis stuff. She had put on weight and a lot of weight over the years. She was very, very overweight and probably just sitting a lot because of her condition. And, and, and she couldn't lift her arms. She said to me, can you help me too? I'm like, and I walked over, I said, honey, what's going on? And, and, and she had become just a very heavy woman. I'm not being crude. I'm, it's, I, I wasn't sure how much mobility she would have just had because she had gotten very large. And, and, and she said, it's arthritis. She said, and she made a comment about, I have been immobile and I put on so much weight, but it's gotten to the point I can't even lift my arms up at all. I said, you mean right now you can't lift your arms? She said, she went, this is as high as they go. And she lifted them like her arms, like nothing. And I said, oh my goodness, all these people are watching this man standing there, prayed for her, and said, lift your hands, honey, high above your head. She goes straight up like this and just starts. <laughs> She's bowing. And the, it was such a move of the presence of God. And I started to share with the people and, and, and pray. And this Spanish girl says, don't you see what's happening, guys? The Lord sent this man here. He sent him here so that we turn from our ways and turn back to God. And I'm like, this is like a movie. And I was like, yeah. And then I picked up from there and really preached and shared and still didn't pray the prayer to go to heaven with any of. I shared what God was saying and what this young lady just said. Do you realize, and you, sir, you've been hurt and you've left life take its toll. And a man comes and loves you and you can't even receive it because life has repositioned you. But yet God is the same and loves you. And I'm preaching like, and they're like. <laughs> and I began to hug them all. And they're crying and hug them all and love them all. And I said, have an amazing day. Go after Jesus. Live with him and for him for all, with all your heart, da, 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 whatever. I said, and I turn and walk away. Now, see, we think that I missed it because I didn't pray the prayer. You didn't lead them to the Lord. I gave them the Lord. Right. Holy Spirit is a very big boy. <laughs> and he knows exactly what to do now. <laughs> see, because that, that is serious plowing ground and serious seed. We planted a whole, we planted a whole crop. We probably watered and seeded. But who gives the increase? God. If they just said, sir, what must we do to be saved? That's an easy response. But I promise you, I wouldn't have prayed a prayer to go to heaven. I'd have took them to some water. See, that's where we need challenged in the church. I'd have talked about death to live and denying themselves. And what you must be 
do to be saved is give your life back to him. And let's go find some water and let's baptize you so you can be born again. It's not a quick prayer to go to heaven. And then life's the same. It's the transformation of life. I don't lead people in a prayer to go to heaven without taking them to water. I've baptized a whole lot of people in hotel swimming pools. A lot. I go to the desks and ask the clerk if I can take them in. I'm staying in room such and such. Now, they're not here, but, but it would be a great honor because of water baptism. Do you understand? And most of the time, they're like, oh, okay. And I'll say, well, they've just surrendered their life to Jesus. It's very important. If you could give us the liberty of the hotel, we'd be grateful and thankful. And I've never been told no. We've taken as many as 12, 15 people into a hotel swimming pool that they weren't staying in the hotel I was and took the whole crew in and baptized as many as six, seven, eight people at a time. Hmm. I took a teenager to the hotel bath, uh, bathtub in the room, a teenager from New York, not while he was 19, and we were in Florida, but he was in New York. I'm talking to him, and he said, Dude, I need, I need this. I need saved, man. I need my life free. I said, let me tell you something. It's not a prayer to go to heaven. And they I hear what you're saying. I need this. I said, let's go to the bathtub. I'll fill it up. We're going to baptize you. You ready to surrender your life? Yes, sir. Took him in the room, into the hotel bathtub, filled it as far as I could. And I talked to him about what you're doing. And he crossed his arms like this, and I slid him down under. And when I brought him up, the holy presence of God came over the water that I had to back out of the room. And the Lord said, I'm here to father him. Leave me alone. And it was so holy, he couldn't even, he just went, and I said, that's your father now. He loves you. He's going to father you. He wants to talk with you. I'll see you later. I slid out. He was in that bathtub for about 40, 45 minutes, never moved. When he came out, his face, like you said about your mother, totally changed. He didn't even look like the same boy. <laughs> but we're sowing seeds. Sometimes we're reaping. Well, we haven't even sown. But somebody sowed. That's why you're reaping. You're not reaping because you're a hot shot evangelist. You're reaping because somebody sowed. You're not reaping and then holding conferences how to reap. You're misunderstanding. If you think it's because you're a great evangelist and that's why you're reaping, there's intercessors paving the way. There's people sowing. And you're privileged to walk into the effects of the faith of the body of Christ. Don't you ever miss that, or you'll be proud in your ministry. Boy, I don't know why I said that so sharp, but boy, that one felt sharp. <laughs> For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, and then the sickle. Last one, I know we're late. I, I'm trying to quit here. I just Let me just read this one thing if you have three minutes here. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we picture it? It's pretty intense. This is the parable we should picture, the kingdom of God. It is like a mustard seed, which is when it was sown on the ground, is the smallest seed of all seeds on the earth. Oh, so you could see it's so small, it's too insignificant to plant. But when it is sown, when that small little seed is sown, comma, guess what happens to it? When it's sown, what? It grows. <laughs> Come on, be simple with me. When it's sown, it grows. It grows up and becomes what? Greater than all the herbs, shoots, out large branches, the birds, the air. There's a principle there. You can see, yeah, well, the context he's talking is this and that. Well, he's saying the, the parable of the kingdom of God and how should we picture is like this. You take a small seed and you place it in the hand of God, sown in love by faith, and you can't possibly measure it because the Spirit of God is now moving. So sow seeds everywhere you go. Just love people. Just, just, just quick little. We're going to talk more in this school about actual practicality. I didn't get to it today. I wanted to. I just didn't. I don't know where we went. I was trying to can with grandma. I don't know where we went. <laughs> I was so lost. That was a scary feeling. I have never been lost preaching like that. That was weird. <laughs> I still haven't returned. I still have no clue what I was doing. That's a weird thought. Why don't we stand and get out of this, okay? <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't hear that, I would, but <laughs> maybe he'll say that. But, oh my, I give a lot of my stuff away. My buddy Dave Newman, he gets a lot of the perk and benefit of my kitchen labors. My wife loves that I'm a canner. You know, you know my incentive when I can? I, I, am, I am so pursued, and my life is accounted for. It really is. And I'll shut down and just can like that. And I'll, I'll call in the middle while I'm doing things. But then once I'm canning, I'm canning. I had somebody call me, and they're crying out for me to pick up the phone if I'm there. And I'm covered with stuff, and I'm canning, and the kettle's cooking, and I just go and pick up the phone. So I was like, well, canning overruled here. But uh, you know what gives me incentive? That I see the joy set before me. It's not work to me in the kitchen because I know in January in a cold day I'm going to crack that lid and eat those pizzas. And it, it's just it's a cool thought. Yeah. It's the joy set before me. The labor isn't in vain. It's not work to me. It's incentive. I'm putting away for another day. It's just cool. So I love it. Last year I did all the canon. This year it looks like I'm doing it all again too. My wife <laughs> left me for three weeks. And went to Montana. She's not back till Thursday. And I'll be in New York when she gets home. So I won't see her till Sunday night. But I'll have all the cannon pretty much wrapped up when she's home. And she say, good for you, honey. <laughs> Keep on cannon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Father, we just thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. Thanks for transforming our lives. Thanks for Patty's testimony about mom. You're doing that in all of us. And you're honestly, we believe you're doing that in everyone we love. We're not going to just look with our eyes, debrief, and get intellectual. We're thanking you for the move of your spirit. We're thanking you for the joy of sowing. Just like Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry wasn't debriefing to see if he failed or, or, or succeeded. He was remaining in faith and walking in love. And when he was lifted up, there was a release of your spirit to draw all men unto him. Even though people didn't get it then, they got it short, short after. And when thousands rejected one day... All of a sudden, thousands received another. And then thousands more and thousands more. Thank you for letting your love never fail. Thank you for teaching us the integrity of faith. Thank you for teaching us not to get our eyes on what we see and what our minds feels and thinks. Thank you for getting us deeper and having greater vision and greater faith and trust in you. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we release right now our faith in this truth that it's embedded in us. And that we won't let our eyes deceive us. Because it's not with a mind that a man believes, but with his heart. And we thank you that you teach us to live from the heart. In Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, guys. I will see you next week. Amen. Bless you all.